as we continue growing in these and all the days when we're thrown off by little changes or uncertainties or everything that might distract us from our God. We can rejoice that he is continuing to grow us. That as this is the first day after Pente the first Sunday after Pentecost, we can rejoice that that spirit is still here. It is still guiding and directing and encouraging. It is still with us when we fall down and when we rise up. It is with us as we go out and when we come in. With that in mind, on this day of ordinary time, let us draw close to God and hear his word. Let us hear first this reading from Jonah, chapter 1, the first three verses. Pray that we'll listen and hear what scripture is saying to us, the church. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amerta, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah set out to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid his fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us hear also this reading from 2 Corinthians. He'll be reading in chapter 10, the first 11 verses. I pray that we are still listening and that we hear what Scripture is saying to us church. I myself, Paul, appeal to you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ. I who am humble when face to face with you, but bold toward you when I am away. I ask that when I am present, I need to show no boldness, but daring to oppose those who think we are acting according to human standards. Indeed, we live as human beings, but we do not wage war according to human standards. For the weapons of our warfare are not merely human, but they have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. We are ready to punish every disobedience when your obedience is complete. Look at what is before your eyes. If you are confident that you belong to Christ, remind yourself of this, that just as you belong to Christ, so also do we. Now, if I boast a little too much of our authority, which the Lord gave for building you up and not for tearing you down, I will not be ashamed of it. I, don't want, I do not want to seem as though I am trying to frighten you with my letters. For they say these letters are weighty and strong, but his boldly presence is weak and his speech contemptible. Let such people understand that we say by letter when absent, we also do when present. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. In all these things, let us trust our God. Let us lean into his work and let us be made whole and well. This time I invite Diana for our children's sermon, for our good news message. Just like the earth is spinning on this, the no, earth, that's 
Yeah, it spins. It keeps spinning around and around as it has ever since God created the earth. The first words in the Bible right there in the beginning. God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was at, without form and void and the darkness was over the face of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, let there be light. And do you know then what he said? He said, <coughs> it was good. So y'all are going to repeat that. Every time I, I say, and God said, then y'all say, it was, it was good. Okay? All right. So he created light. And then he said, there needs to be a space to separate the waters of the heavens from the waters on the earth. So God made a space to separate the earth from the heavens called it sky and God said it was good y'all can say it too next God brought all the waters of the earth together to make the oceans and the seas and to create dry land between them and then he covered the dry land with flowers and trees and grass and God said it was good God paused looked at the beautiful trees and flowers and said it was good. It was good. Then he continued his creation. He created the sun, moon, and stars. They were beautiful. God looked at them, and again he said, it was, it was good. Then God created the birds and fish. He blessed them and told them to multiply so that the sea would be filled with fish of all shapes and sizes, and the air would be filled. Yeah, just like that. I've got a bookmark that has the whale from Jonah. Um, so the sea would be filled with fish of all shapes and sizes, and the air would be filled with beautiful birds. God looked at them and smiled and said, it was good. Then God created, sorry, whoops. Uh, finally, God made the animals, tall, skinny giraffes and furry little squirrels. He made cuddly little kittens and big, ferocious lions, animals of every kind. Then God made man and woman. The Bible says he made people to be like him. And he put them in charge of all that he had created. The fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living creature. And God said, it was good. It was good. <laughs> when God had finished, he looked at all that he had created. And he said, that is very good. It was very good. Let's go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for creating us. Thank you for creating us in your image. And we pray that we will be grateful every day for the life you've given us and that we will follow after you. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. Are ready to go downstairs? We were still in that time when everything was good. Back before the sin came that we introduced and brought about so much trouble and heartache. It was good. It's not anymore. Anybody that's saying things are good now is missing out on that big part that we can hold on to. That sin has perverted and changed and made a mess of so, so many things. I mean, the reality of Jonah, all that we know of him is this retelling from this story, but he is referred to in Hebrew tradition as being a great leader and a teacher. So why would such a great leader and teacher, when given a direct and powerful word from God, immediately run the other way? You might think that about yourselves. It's like, I'm I'm a pretty good person. I, I do the right thing. And then you find yourself doing what you know you should not do. 
you've turned and run from what God has directed you to do. You may be saying a harsh, harsh word to the most beloved person in your life. You may be furious and mad at yourself and tell yourself all sorts of terrible things about yourself and how you got here and whatever else. Maybe someone else says something bad about your family lineage. Who knows what sets us off? Maybe you're a bit more subtle in how you turn from the Lord. Maybe you know you need to be taking care of what you eat, but you're like me and you love food and you go and find it needed for comfort. I'm a person who eats their feelings. So I have a stressful day, I eat. If I have a hard day, I like to eat. Food is just fabulous without having all that, but you know, it's a great thing. We're supposed to at least be thankful and give thanks every time we eat something so it reminds us it's not the food that is our comfort, it is the God who blessed us with that food. We're so often held captive by those things. <clears throat> Do you look at yourselves as being held captive? I dare say for most of us, when we're reading that scriptures that talk about numerous times throughout the Bible that he came to set the captives free, we're thinking, well, it's for all those people who are in slavery. It's where we've missed out on how we're in slavery, most often to our own very thoughts. Why Paul was telling the Corinthian church that we need to hold our thoughts captive. We need to filter everything through Scripture, just as he did in that reading there from Corinthians. That just as you think you're Christian, we need to think that they're Christian. Just as you may think you're righteous and perfect and wonderful, we need to remember all the world is and is made up of children of our gracious and loving God. And that we're all prone to sinfulness. I saw someone this week who was having a moment of, I thought, great self-righteousness and proclaiming how so many things are being done wrong in the church and in other places. And unfortunately, I know about their life and everything that they were saying, like, yeah, but you do this and you do that and you do this and you do that. Now, what position do you have to be so arrogant? And in case of y'all thinking that of me, just know that when I wrote this sermon, I immediately saw even more all the places I'm held captive. All the things that hold me in bondage. You may be thinking, well, what might that be? Well, let me give you just a few examples. I kind of talked about a little bit of how we might be saying something hateful to the person who loves us most in the world. We so often forget our vows in marriage, I do believe. Again, you see people fighting that are married. It's just that. They've lost track of that they're married. That they love this person so much they committed to spend their life together for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. But how often do we actually live that out, that we've held that thought captive and lived that very thing out? Again, how many of us are held captive by so many random things? Again, this faithful, I don't want to become that person or I don't want to act that way, but then we end up acting a different other way that's just as terrible as that way we were trying to avoid. What's holding you captive? Maybe it's the people's opinions around you. You're thinking, oh, they're going to judge me for wearing this or for looking like that or for being this way or that. Or maybe you're thinking, I judge them for looking this way or that way or for believing this way or voting that way. Are we giving God grace? Are we doing what Scripture tells us? Or are we holding a record of wrongs? Are we being humble? Or are we being braggadocious and prideful? God makes it very clear we should be turning to Him, not running to some mighty ship to carry us far, far away from God. God has us everywhere we go. Again, he spoke everything into being. He spoke in, as Diane talked about in her good news message, the sun and the sky and the moon. He spoke in everything out in the universe and everything here as well. <coughs> we can't go by our human standards. By our human standards, Jonah was right not to want to go to Nineveh. Those Ninevites were terrible people. I don't remember all the terrible things they said they did, but there's not any of them that are redeemable according to what we are aware of. <laughs> they did all the worst things that you could do. But God didn't care about how bad they were. He wanted them to hear that word of hope and redemption. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
we may be saying some terrible things about ourselves. They may all be true. There may be terrible things said about all sorts of people we know, but God is not one who came to beat us up and tear us down. What did he come to do? To lift us up. Why we need to hold those thoughts captive? Because again, if we're running off of the idea, oh, I can do this because they're that, or I can treat them this way because they're that, we're not being held captive by God's love, hope, joy, and peace. why on the cross, Christ being the holy and divine and mighty and wonderful for all those people who had just nailed him up there, for all those people who were calling for his crucifixion, he said Lord, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Why we have to hold our thoughts captive, because it's way too easy for us to say, nope, I'm not giving them forgiveness. The other thing we need to hold on to is just because we think we've run for the Lord and now we're in great trouble, we need to remember the whole of Jonah's story. He thought, throw me into the sea that I might die. Again, he still isn't ready to go to Nineveh. And that fish swallowed. Then after that fish swallowed him, it spit him up where he needed to be. Oh, and the fish was probably, didn't take any time at all to get to Nineveh. He was waiting for him to start giving God thanks and praise. Once he got the right attitude, the fish spat him out on the sea. How do you suppose the Ninevites would have reacted if this Jew, who they'd had no problem beating up Jews and tearing them to pieces and whatever else, would have responded when they're there on the beach and a fish spat the guy out? And he said, repeat. Don't think that you've had such a terrible past that you can't be used for God. He may need you to get run around inside a fish for a while and then spit out so you're in the right mindset, the right mental capacity, the who knows what, to do what you need to do. I'm glad I've got some of you laughing. The rest of you may be in shock thinking, oh no, where's the fish coming that's going to eat me? <laughs> Don't worry, I've had that thought myself. God uses us in all situations. Why we need to run our thoughts, hold them captive and run them through that filter of Scripture. To be humble and gracious and kind to think, no, Lord, put me in this terrible position so that I can minister to whoever else is here with me. God put me in this terrible position because that's where I needed to come through to get to that moment of sitting in the belly of a fish and giving God thanks and praise because God is still gracious and kind. I hope none of y'all had to go through that valley, to go through that hardship, to be sitting in that fish for two days before you could give a day of praise. I pray that we're all starting out in the right mindset, but since I know we're all broken, let's just rejoice that God is gracious even when we're in that spot. Then if we call to mind what God will do, we can trust that we can give thanks and praise even in the darkest of places. That we can hold our thoughts captive and rejoice that God is enabling us to move into a new level of living. We may have to live like Paul with several thorns in our flesh, several things that pull us down, several hardships, prejudices, uncertainties, but God still calls us to minister and love, not because we are strong, but because he is. Probably the most important thing we need to hold captive. Every time we're thinking, I'm too weak, I'm too this, I'm too that. Nope, God is bigger. God is able to use us where we are. Believe me, folks, I'd love to have that easy button where we could all be set free of all those burdens, but that's not the reality for us. God is with us in those burdens. I'm sure Paul didn't want to have to write this letter and have these people saying, well, you talk one way here and another way in your letters. He's like, folks, remember, we're in this together. I can be kinder and more gentler when I'm there because I can hear and I can understand. I'm only getting the part that you wrote me to give you a letter of response. My caution to you, don't do that modern idea of having all sorts of discussions over text or leaving a message. You need to interact with people in person to truly understand what's going on. If someone sends you a terrible text message, don't send them something terrible back. Say, it seems there's a reason for us to meet in person and work out this situation. Is this time available? 
Again, one way to hold our thoughts captive so we don't hear something that wasn't how they actually meant it to be translated and keep everything going with it. Let us hold our thoughts captive. Let us be all that God has called and made us to be. Let that Holy Spirit wash over us. Again, it's the biggest thing of holding your thoughts captive. It's so easy to run off, as you might have heard. He ran off half cocked. He was going along like his tail was a fire and his head was catching. <laughs> Obviously, those people weren't holding their thoughts captive. Went to a wilderness first aid class and they caught me off. He said, the first thing you do when you find yourself in a wilderness first aid situation is to combobulate yourself. And I'm like, what? Well, you've heard of being discombobulated. That's often what we do when we get in a terrible situation. We need to combobulate ourselves. We need to hold our thoughts captive. We need to say, Lord, I don't know where this is going, but I look forward to seeing how you're going to work out one of your amazing and wonderful, glorious things. I'm right there with you. I don't combobulate easily. I often don't pull myself together as quick as I'd like to. I often walk around with a shoe in my mouth where I should have stopped before I operated my mouth. But if we can hold those thoughts captive, when we can continue to grab hold of our gracious and loving God, when we abide with Him, we can be that overcomer that Paul talks about. We can be that blessing in season and out of season that God called and made us to be. Not because we're perfect, but because we've held our thoughts captive by the power of our loving Savior. That we do, as our baptismal vows talks about, we turn back to our perfect Savior, join with fellow believers, and go out and do good. Let us be that church of Pentecost. Let us be those God-filled, Holy Spirit people that renew this world yet again, that renew our lives and the lives of everyone around us. Let us rise up and do good for God's honor and glory and praise this day and forevermore. To God be the glory. Amen and amen. Family of God, I invite you to stand if you are able to join in our statement of faith, our affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. will be the reading the traditional one. You may recite it from memory, or you may join in reading with me from 14, page 14 of your blue hymn, the traditional Apostles' Creed. Join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.